Happy Wednesday, everybody. Welcome to another episode of With Sonar. I'm Tanner DeHart, joined alongside Tony Mulvey. We have an awesome episode lined up for you guys today. Going to be taking a little bit of updates on the market, what's going on with outbound rejections, going to dive into some rate spreads, and we actually have an awesome guest going to be joining us a little bit later from Dunavant. But Tony, how has your week been so far? You know, it's been good. Uh, some interesting things happening in the market, right? We we talked about some some stability in rates, and it's gone. You blink, and it's gone. So, uh, I mean, seeing, again, uh, that continued softness in the market is persisting. And it, it when a time you thought, okay, maybe this is the time to start seeing things maybe slow down and bottom out, not see any more aggressive downward movements, we're seeing some, some movements lower, which is... Uh, it can be concerning depending on what side of the, the aisle you're on. Absolutely. And we thought we had a bottom, right? Yeah. About 20 days long, we were looking pretty good. We even thought, hey, looks like we might even get some summer recovery, right? Yep. Next we get some upward trend and it just, it did not happen. Yeah. No, it didn't hold. And, you know, you start looking at some of this upstream data points. I mean, I was looking at a few today. Uh more on the consumer front, and it's just like you look at this, and it's it's not real positive. I mean, consumers are willing to take on more and more debt. You had the Fed raise interest rates once again, right? So, it's a uh, I think from a consumer standpoint right now, it's challenging. I think you're seeing some signs of industrial slowing on certain in certain sectors of the industrial economy, but other ones are still holding up okay. But I mean, overall. You start looking upstream down the ocean pipeline and like it hasn't done anything. I mean, it's just trended sideways. So uh, it's definitely a, a trying time to be in the transportation market. Absolutely. Let's go ahead and pull that first chart up looking at outbound tender rejection index. Um, so this is looking at basically the percentage of contracted freight that is being churned down and falling down that popular waterfall routing guide that we talk about. Uh, as of this morning, we are at a new cycle low at about 2.79%, 2.75%. Um, basically, nothing's hitting the spot market. If, if you're a broker or a carrier, you're, you're pretty much accepting any opportunity. Yeah, and I think that's going to be a trend you'll see for a while, right? I mean, we've looked at it, and I know we're going to talk about it here in a second when we pull up another chart, but I mean, the spread between contract and spot is so wide and so favors the contract side of the market, like, why would you turn down any freight that you have coming? Because it, even if you had to go play in the spot market, one, your rate's not near as good. And is the volume going to be there is the better question. And I mean, right now, both are no, because like you said, I mean, we're talking, what, 2.73%. So what, basically 98% of contracted freight is being accepted. It's about the natural floor because you have capacity, network imbalances, capacity gets out of like where you, it can service the freight, right? And so you'll never, or you likely won't have a rejection rate, well, at least on a national level under two, it might do that. I mean, even during COVID, this is about where we were, right? Like the shutdown, very different overall economy as compared to what, the end of April, 2020, early May, when we bottomed out there at what, just under 2%, right at 2%, pretty close to where we are right now. It's, uh, again, it's, you would think that this is a time where you see that hopefully start to move higher, right? The capacity tighten up a little right before, because you've got what, DOT week is not, I think it starts next week. Uh, and then you've got Memorial Day, what, three, four weeks away now. So it's, you've got the, the catalyst to tighten capacity and it's just not doing it because there's no incentive to get out of a contract. Absolutely. And there's a lot of things that's coming down the pipeline. And what better than to maybe speak with an industry expert and a good friend of mine, Kelly Lomax, is CFO of Dunavant Enterprises. Uh, Kelly's going to join us now. Kelly, if you can hear us, how are you doing today? Oh, Tanner, doing great. Uh, Tony, uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, looking forward to chatting with you guys. Uh, you know, I think Tony uh, kind of stole my thunder. Uh, you know, it's... Uh, it's a challenging time to be in the market, but, uh, you know, in this industry, but, uh, you know, that's kind of been the case over the last couple of years. So, uh, you know, that's, that's, uh, exciting times. 
Absolutely. And um, Kelly Dunavant, it's a hometown company for me. I've known you guys for a long time. What What is Dunavant doing differently or what is Dunavant? How have you guys kind of held on and what are some things you're looking forward to in the rest of this year? Well, you know, uh, what are we looking forward to? Unfortunately, I think as Tony mentioned, you know, we're uh, we're kind of in that environment right now where, you know, I think J.B. Hunt, uh, they announced it and characterized it very accurately on the earnings call. You know, we're in a freight recession. And unfortunately, there's just not much moving right now. So you've got to really differentiate yourself from the uh, competition. Uh, you know, the way I look at it, we do a lot of export uh, export commodity business. And, you know, kind of thinking through where we are right now, it uh, reminds me of back in like 2017, 2018, when the tariffs came on for the lumber industry. And, you know, we saw that uh, industry really stop all the way back to the chainsaw. So uh, I think that's effectively where we are today. Uh, you know, it's it stopped all the way back to the consumer, uh, back to the Chinese factory. Um, I think everybody thought with the Chinese New Year, the uh, you know, with the uh, one China COVID policy being relieved, that uh, you know, the reopening of that economy would really prop up the global economy. But uh, you know, it just really hadn't happened. And you know, so what are we doing? You know, we uh, we we continue to look to differentiate ourselves and. You know, I think that's going to be, you know, that's going to be the secret once we, uh, you know, to get through this, but then also once we get through this uh, going forward. Absolutely. And the best way to look forward to that is using sonar data. And so my next question is, what what part does sonar play at Dunavant Inter- Enterprises? Well, you know, great question. Uh, you know, as we look to differentiate ourselves, you know, Tanner, I think we've been on the journey with you guys for, well, probably over two years now. And you know, sonar is one of the great tools that we've been integrating into our business. Uh, we continue to integrate it. Uh, you know, it's uh, you know it really provides that real-time data uh, that's really quick and easy to access from the strategic level all the way down to the tactical day-to-day operations. And you know, from my desk, uh, you know, I start most mornings getting a general sense of the uh, macro environment through various media channels. Uh, you know, I spent a lot of time with Google News and then also, you know, all the uh, production thought process that you guys put out uh, through freight waves, the daily updates. And, you know, one of the really cool things is the sonar infographic, uh, you know, on the freight waves website. You know, it's got all the great information right there, real time. You know, as we we're talking about earlier, the uh, tender rejection rates, the uh, outbound tenders, you've got the uh, import data, uh, diesel, uh, rail, you know, overall price. So, you know, from that aspect, real quick uh, uh, place to get good insight. And, you know, that insight is really, you know, we at Dunavit, uh, our COO and myself and the rest of the senior management team have really been able to change the uh, the level of our discussions. And, you know, this helps us to really assess the overall market, you know, as we're talking about today with, uh, you know, pricing, you know, a lot of pricing going down. This helps us to, you know, quickly pivot. Uh, make sure we understand where the pricing is going, look at uh, capacity utilization and, you know, just really make good strategic decisions. Whereas in the past, you know, uh, and I can say this being a a reformed accountant, it's been a lot of years with KPMG uh, here in Memphis and throughout, um, you know, working on audits. But, uh, you know, you'd have to wait three, four, five weeks for the accountants to close the books. And, you know, before you're able to review it to determine kind of, you know, what pivot you're going to make and, you know, now with sonar, you know, you can have this uh, information readily available. You can make decisions, you know, very quickly. And, you know, we're finding a lot of success with that, you know, able to adjust our operations and pricing way faster than what we've normally done. And, you know, that's uh, really what I would say has helped us to be, uh, stay ahead of the curve and the competition. You know, thinking about it from a tactical level, um, you know, the various applications within sonar, you know, we're doing a lot of great things. Uh, you know, it allows us to monitor the overall market trends. Uh, we can predict uh, market demand, you know, and especially like today um, and not really today's environment, but, you know, uh, back when the freight was really running over the last couple of years, you know, it helped us to really optimize the drivers, uh, equipment utilization. And, you know, it's just the vast amount of knowledge and data real time that it, it gives us. It's just it's 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 awesome. Uh, but, you know, Tanner, you know, back to your question, uh, you know, you guys made the announcement a couple of weeks ago, and I think this is where the real benefit uh, everyone in the industry and spot chain, I think, can get a lot of great value is once we get this down into the TMS systems and, you know, really into the hand of the operators, I think that's where we're going to see even more uh, great things going on. And, 
you know, I'm just excited. Uh, I'm excited every time you guys, uh, you know, issue new things and new apps. And, you know, like I said, we've been integrating it in and, you know, look forward to continue integrating it. Yeah. And I think one of the interesting parts you brought up, I mean, as you said, alluded to your past life as an accountant, waiting those three, four, five weeks, determining pivots. I mean, the freight industry really has been, I don't want to say a slow adopter of technology, but it, it the digitization has kind of lagged behind some of these other industries. Like how, where, where does that need to go? Where does the freight industry need to go towards that? Because I mean, obviously, really in the last, what, 10 years or so, like that's been a hot topic uh, around freight tech and the like there. Like how, how important is that going to play out over, say, the next 10 years? And, and what gaps really need to be filled as we move forward? Oh, no, a great question. You know, um, yes, uh, yes, I, I think it's going to be even uh, faster than 10 years, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, I think the uh, our industry supply chain, uh, you know, I think like every industry, I think we continue to be a bit behind on digitization. Uh, but I think mainly that's due to the fact that the rapid advancement of that technology. I mean, think about it. Uh, six, seven months ago, you know, this this word that we talk about now a lot, chat GPT. You know, you didn't really that wasn't really part of the vocabulary. And now, you know, we're having conversations, you know, whether or not our kids are using it for their homework. Uh, you know, we're talking, you know, some uh, audit partners throughout uh, the industry. And, you know, they continue to talk about how that's being brought into their industry as well. But, you know, I think um, a lot of industries have embraced the digitization. I mean, think about this. I think it was the last time you went into the banking uh, physical bank uh, with the check, you know, that. Uh, that's really an antiquated uh, concept now. I think, you know, we can, uh, with the power of your cell phone, you can easily move funds. I think we saw that uh, really back about two months ago, back in March with uh, SVB. Uh, you know, you're able to move your money from one bank to the next within a matter of seconds. And, you know, I think that's what may have caused a lot. But, you know, back to your question in our industry, you know, kind of thinking about where we came from, you uh, you know, just thinking of the trucking industry, you know, we had done a bit. So we are, uh, we're kind of a unique bird in the fact that, uh, you know, we are really a one-stop shop uh, supply chain from start to finish. Uh, so we get to see the supply chain all the way from the start, like you said, back from the Chinese factories all the way through to the U.S. door. And, you know, if you think back to the uh, trucking industry, uh, up until, what was it, 2016 or so, uh, you know, heck, we are still running on paper logs. And, uh you know, the supply chain prior to COVID, you know, it just wasn't, it wasn't talked about. You, people ask you what, what industry you're in and you tell them supply chain logistics and, uh, you yeah, know, I'm accustomed to this too. Uh, you know, it's uh, no different than being an accountant. Uh, you know, they, they look at you like, uh, like you got four heads coming out of your head and, uh, you know, logistics was just an afterthought. Many companies didn't really have to worry about it. Uh, back in that dynamic, you were, uh, you know, you were focused on one thing. It was produce a widget to make sure you got it to your store. You waited on the customer to come by, pick it up, decide they want it. And then, you know, it, it changed. Uh, you know, they, they had this plan and react strategy and it worked. So, you know, why did you need to fix it? So it was, uh, you know, it was antiquated looking to be digitized. But, uh, you know, think of Amazon. I think, to be honest with you, I think Amazon really moved the needle. You know, prior to COVID, uh, they introduced Prime. You know, you could be sitting on your uh, your sofa or your wife could or whoever, and you could order something. And within two days, you know, it's going to be at your doorstep. And if you had any questions, you didn't have to call a 1-800 number. You could just look on your phone. You could track it from the, the factory uh, or the distribution center all the way through the supply chain and to your back to your door. And you know, I think that really opened our eyes to the visibility. Uh, and then, you know, obviously COVID hits. And, you know, I think uh, some spouses, uh, they may have uh, made it a hobby or became very good at uh, if they had an Olympic sport, they'd probably be really good at it. But uh, ordering from Amazon, I mean, that was the thing. Think about it. So now, you know, with e-commerce, you know, I think it's, it's really changing it. It's changed our industry. It's changed the expectations that, you know, how do we get our product to the customer? The customer wants to see the information. So it's, you know, it, it's a lot more complex these days. So therefore, you got to have a more uh, complex, uh, innovative supply chain. So I think that, uh, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of great technology coming down the uh, 
down, coming down the pike, I mean, you think about, uh, you know, what Ryan Rogers and them are doing, Tex Locate, you know, you're starting to put that capability in the trucks. And, you know, I think it's just, uh, I think it's, it's the bright time. I think it's a fun time to be in this industry. I think you're going to see a lot of, uh, a lot of things come to fruition, whether it be artificial intelligence, predictive analytics, uh, but, you know, with all technology, things like that, there are gaps. And I think that uh, some of the things that we got to think through and work through. Yeah, Kelly, and looking at maybe the instability of the market and maybe going to recession, as a CFO, your primary job is kind of long, sustainable financial growth. And so I know you and I talk about it, predictive analysis, forecasting analysis. How big of a role do you think that's going to play in 2023 than in past years? And then second question is, do you think a chat GPT or some type of AI tool could possibly start to wrap into that forecasting world? Uh, the short answer is yes. You know, I, I don't want to say no because, I mean, come on, let's think about it. Uh, you know, here in America, capitalism will drive all innovation. I think, you know, we Americans do a very good job of, uh, you know, creating that next thing. Uh, the short answer to your question, like I said, yes. Yes, I think we will. I think, uh, you know, artificial intelligence is, uh, you know, it's going to be used, you know, I think because supply chains worldwide, you know, they recognize, like I said earlier, that uh, you've got to have technology if you want to compete. And that's one of the things that, you know, we had done of it, um, you know, we're very focused on, I think, uh, you know, back, we brought in a new COO and CIO about three years ago. And, you uh, you know, it's been awesome, uh, both uh, Chris and Michael, you know, being able to sit down with them and kind of think through what do we want to do in the future? What are we going to look like? You know, and start having these conversations. And, you know, we, we've done a lot, like I talked about. We've integrated uh, sonar into the processes. You know, we've moved, um, you know, other applications, uh, you know, and really incorporating that into our uh, into our workflows, our processes, our, our thought, you know, and it really gets back to, uh, you know, our CEO, Bill, uh, Donovan would tell us, you know, you got to work smarter, not harder. And, you know, that's what, uh, I think that's what's going to really separate, you know, those who are able to make it out of here. I think that's what's going to separate them going forward. Uh, you know, you've got a lot of, uh, I would say, middle and um, probably larger uh, some logistics firms, you know, as well as many shippers, um, you know, taking on digitization, uh, things like that. But, you know, there are some, I mean, I was looking at a PwC study uh, just recently. They had surveyed, I think it was like 300 uh, executives about uh, supply chain and digitization. And, you know, they, they mentioned a couple of obstacles. You know, the first one, obviously, is just the standard one. It's not really a great surprise. It's just uh, I'm not going to change my refusal to change. But the other one, I think, uh, you know, why haven't we seen much movement? I would say that, you know, many executives uh, communicated that their more uh, focus was more on the basic near term priorities and challenges they were faced with, you know, especially in their supply chain. You know, you think about it uh, over the last few years, you know, you were just hoping to get through the day. You're hoping to be able to cover that load. It was really all about capacity. But you know, now that the we're starting to see the softness in the market, you know, now that people are starting to, uh, you know, get pressures from their CFOs, you know, people like me asking, all right, you spent all this money over the last two years. How are you going to, you know, how are you going to weed that out? I think there's going to be a lot more focus. I think you're going to see a lot of, you know, people thinking about it, starting to do it. And then you've also got the uh, regulatory environment coming down the pike with, uh, you know, the sustainability goals, specifically the scope three emissions. I don't, I'm not sure that a lot of companies, you know, really thought through that. I know that's one thing we had done of it. We, we take very serious uh, sustainability, conservation. Uh, you know, so I think you're going to start seeing a lot more. Obviously, you're going to have to, if, you know, these firms want to be able to compete. Uh, you know, they're going to have to uh, monitor. They're going to have to transmit their uh, impact carbon footprint, you know, upwards throughout the supply chain as part of uh, the SEC and the ESG requirement. So, you know, yes, we're going to see a lot of it. Uh, back to your question, artificial intelligence, you know, like we talked about, another great example of rapid emergence of technology, you know, that we're experiencing. Uh, you know, are we going to see chat GPT? Yeah, I think we're already starting to see it. You know, you go to... Uh, whatever website you go to, you, uh, you know, I was on a website just the other day and all of a sudden it just popped up, you know, 
how can I help you? What are you looking for? Well, obviously, you know, that's got some artificial intelligence built into it. And, you know, we're doing that here. You know, um, how do you get how do you work smarter, faster and not harder? You know, we've incorporated, you know, great application into really our process that, you know, allows us to, um, you know, recognize documents once we get them into an email. It's uh, based on the information provided, the machine learning over the last time it did it and uh, before that, you know, it's able to recognize the documents, route them to the appropriate person in the department. We're talking within seconds where, you know, back in the old days, you uh, you had to wait for someone to deliver the mail, pick up the mail, scan it. And now, you know, you're seeing it being emailed over very quickly. So I see that uh, back office. I also see it within customer service. Uh, you know, and it's funny you asked that question, Tanner. Uh, yeah, we were talking about just the other day. I think that, uh, you know, that was one of the things that we're looking at is how do we utilize that, you know, because it's going to be, I think, the people that realize and understand how to combine sort of artificial intelligence with that human element. I think those are the ones that are going to be successful. Absolutely. Kelly, thank you so much for joining us today. really hope you get the rest of the week and, and I'll see you soon and uh, we'll be back to it. So see you later, Kelly. Thanks. Sounds good. Thank you, guys. Awesome stuff. I mean... <laughs> Yeah. So much information. Absolutely. And it's like, wh what if we do get to a world finally where AI and chat GPT is telling drivers what rate to quote or telling you what to bid or telling you what market to go to? That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, when you think about it, like, Sonar does some of that stuff. Maybe it's not artificial and uh, like it's not telling them right away, but it, it kind of, it kind of gives them at least signals of where to go, right? Yeah. Or, or, I mean, and then we look at market dashboard. I mean, it's, it's got, what, however many lanes. Uh, it, I can't even count, but I mean, you can basically do any Zip3 to Zip3 just about in the U.S. and get a rate. And it seems like this, the analytic side is going to become more and more important to everybody in the supply chain, right? We've talked about it. We talk about it all the time. Like, everybody wants just a rate, but it's more than just a rate. Like, you, it's a lot better to say why a rate is something, why the rate mm -hmm. is what it is, as opposed to this is just what the rate is. And speaking of rates, let's go ahead and look at that rate spread that we had planned. So what you're looking at here is looking at a chart of the blue line is gonna be your line haul contract rate average, and your green line is gonna be your spot market rate average. Right now, we're at about a, what is that, about a 95 it's, cent difference? I mean, yeah. we even climbed over the last few days. I mean, almost a dollar per mile difference between contract and spot right now. Yeah, and that's why earlier this week in the Daily Watch, I wrote that spot rate, or contract rates have a significant room to fall because spot rates are still declining. Contract rates are going to have to, to meet that. I, and I've talked about it, the, the 2019 average, really the 2018 into 2019 average, was 42 cents a mile, was the spread, right? Spot being 42 cents below contract. If you think that was the last, quote, normal market, we've got to get there. We're to upwards of 90 cents. I mean, odds of it coming from a spot rate increase of that size or anywhere close to that, it's very slim. So it's predominantly going to have to come from contract rates declining. And I mean, you're, you're talking what? You get to 40... Eight cents, it puts it right at two dollars a mile, and it puts you at forty-seven cents spread. So, I mean, you're talking a pretty rapid decline, or it could be a rapid decline. I think part of the reason we haven't seen it decline near as fast is shippers may be a little hesitant to drop their rates too fast to force their carriers out of business or to suffer because they remember what. Hopefully, they remember what just happened. Inevitably, capacity is going to tighten up. Market's going to get tight. Capacity is going to be harder to find. You don't want to be in the same situation you just were in where we had rejection rates at 20 plus percent for a year and a half. Absolutely. And you want to be able to still be able to cover and service your freight. Right? Exactly. If you go too cheap, too fast, you lose that. And I think we might have seen a little bit of stability. We did in the chart reach about a 20-day floor in that spot market. We we're like, okay, hey. Right at the bottom, good news, how long can we hold? Yep. And over the weekend, we just fell right back through it. So you're right, Tony, contract rates have a while to go. I think we talk about that 20 cent spread kind of being the difference between contract and line haul to really you get the end of that market cycle. Yep. And I think 
with it being at, at, you know above 90 cents, we've got a while to go to get there. But I think when we do, that'll be your signal for the for the end of the market. Yeah, I, absolutely. And like you said, it, there's there's room to fall, and I think that's the part that's any that's where my I guess second half optimism for for strength kind of dwindles is because like we're still in a pricing environment where these contracts are going to be renewed at lower prices and we're just crossing over like year over year comps being negative right on the contract side and i think that's going to take time to play out and we'll see when it actually does but we'll see it with sonar first absolutely well that do us for here on with sonar we hope you guys have a good rest of your week we'll be back next wednesday at three o'clock